Thank you for joining us for our Friday lecture series. Before we begin, I want to remind you of a little housekeeping. Your cameras, microphones, and chat have been disabled. Throughout the seminar, please submit your questions via the Q&A function, and we'll adjust those towards the end of the talk as time permits. Live captioning has been enabled. It does not always transcribe accurately. And please fill out our survey at the end of the event. This is important to know your thoughts as well as communicate to the Department of Education, um, uh, the university and our community's thoughts on our lecture series. So we'll have some announcements. Our professor by our presentation by Professor Jam, a Q and A session again. The survey. We'd like to thank our co-sponsors for today's event the International Institute, the Department of Asian Languages and Culture, and the Department of Urban Planning. And of course, we always like to thank the Department of Education National Resource Center Title VI grant, which we have at the University of Michigan, which funds this and many of our other events. So it is the end of the semester. Happy end of the semester, everybody. And as well, it being an important day for so many people, we hope you are in a happy holiday season for Easter, Passover, having a peaceful Ramadan. Happy New Year to all of our mainland Southeast Asia friends. And um, enjoy the end of the semester by coming, if you're in Ann Arbor, coming to see Bitter Honey, a film from 2014. We're happy to welcome one of our PhD candidates. So many of you know, Monique Van Reynen. We'll have a discussion after this. And this is next Sunday, April 24th, 2022. Also, those of you in Ann Arbor, we do have our end of the semester celebration this Wednesday. Um, from 3.30 to 5, and please note the, um, the recent bulletins to see the location or email us to register. We're looking forward to seeing you in person for the first time in a few years. And we're really excited about the lecture today, and it's a, very fitting to have such like a forward-thinking and interesting topic um, to end out our lecture series as we start to think about um, moving forward with so many things in our world. Today's lecture is from informal to digital spaces, how to shape the lived experience of networked transformations in Southeast Asia. Um, we'll be welcoming Professor Hoi Tan Zhang, who is an assistant professor at Arizona State University's School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning. Through her research and teaching, she promotes a decentered perspective on planning. She focuses out partic in particular on new mobilities, the platform economy, and their impact on existing urbanism. She graduated from Sciences Pro Reigns in 2010, worked as a consultant in urban development in Asia for six years, and received a PhD in urban planning from the University of Southern California in 2020. So please join us in welcoming her for today's seminar. And again, please uh, feel free to, in, to put questions into the chat as, um, as the talk goes on. So thank you so much, Professor Jam, for coming and sharing your research with us today and your scholarship. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and welcome everyone. So today I will be indeed um, talking about um, my research uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, the title of this talk today is From Informal to Digital Spaces, How to Shape the Lived Experience of Network Transfor Transformations. Just uh, so thank, I think you already know everything you need to know about my background from this introduction. But I just uh, want to give you a little bit um, more context to why I'm doing what I'm doing in the discipline uh, that I chose <laughs> to do it in. So um, after I graduated from a master's degree in political science from Sciences Po Reine in France with a specialization in urban development projects in developing countries, basically was the title of the specialization. I found myself working for a consulting firm based in Hanoi. Um, I mean, I was um, based in the Hanoi office of this consulting firm, and we were working mostly on urban development projects for the, like it was an environmental resource management firm, but the reason being that um, the donors that were funding the projects we were working on, such as the World Bank, the JICA, the Asian Development Bank, and so on and so forth, at the time, we're mostly focusing on um, infrastructure projects. So that's how I found myself towards the end of my six years there, working mostly on um, 
studies in relation to the development of the metro projects in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. Um, at the time, one thing that I would say kind of deeply troubled me was that the rationale of the projects I was promoting, I was contribu contributing to, um, felt to me like it was in a tension, you know, it was like oblivious to the lived experience of people's um, mobility on a day to day basis. As I was living in a country where everyone around me, like the very large majority of the people were relying on the motorbike to move around. And we were talking about those massive projects that were coming and being superimposed on the, on the existing urban fabric, but also like on the existing urban experience. So um, this tension um, is something that I turned into a dissertation project. I conducted my dissertation at USC the title of the dissertation was Productive Frictions and Urbanism in Transitions. What I did is I learned lessons for planning for the intersection between transportation planning and public space um, from observing traffic flows and urban street life in Ho Chi Minh City. So I will be talking about this today, as well as um, how I carried with me kind of this um, way of looking at the lived experience of urban environments in relation to technological transformations of other kinds. So now I'm also interested in the role of the platform economy and how that impacts people's um, everyday experience of uh, the city. And I'm doing this in Southeast Asia. This is another thing I'll be talking about today. Um, I'm also looking at like the automation of street vending based on a phenomenon that's developing in France today, uh, the diffusion of pizza vending machines in particular, which is not something I will talk about today because I can't cover everything and France is not in Southeast Asia. Just uh, to put it in a nutshell, all of the um, projects I'm working on, my research interests, lie at the intersection of mobility issues, both physical and social mobility, and how the two relate to each other. Uh, public space, both physical spaces and digital space spaces, and how people come together as a public in these spaces, and the relation between the two, physical and digital. And when I look at the intersection between these two topics, I tend to do it from the perspective of um, looking towards a normative goal, well, that normative goal is a matter like what interests me is a matter of human development. Um, based on an approach on the issue, you know, very much inspired by the work of Amartya Sen and the capability approach as it has been developed by him and also promoted um, by Martha Nussbaum, among others. So this is um, also something I would be talking about today. But overall, my goal is to advance our understanding of the role of physical and digital networks in shaping inclusive in shaping uh, inclusive spaces or like in um, informing patterns of exclusion. So I already gave you the outline of this talk, and let me start a little bit. Um, let me, let me start with uh, the productive frictions idea that came from my dissertation. So this was more, more of an uh, inductive type of research, even though it's grounded in, in, in a mix of methods. But I will come, <laughs> now that we know the end of the story, I'll start with the conclusion. So the key concept that came out of my work is that of a predictive friction, uh, which I define as um, opportunities for social interactions that are permitted by the contact of the flow of movement, like traffic flows, as they go, at the, as, as they enter in contact with the built environment that um, they traverse. I would explain why that um, is innovative in the field I belong to, that of urban planning, um, in a second. But uh, to give you a little bit more of background, I've had a chance um, to travel to Vietnam since I was a kid. And when I first discovered Vietnam, it was still a time when bicycles were the dominant form of transportation. Uh, the period that I studied, um, let's call it motorbike peak in a way, because this was the time, you know, at the turn, um, following the wave of economic reforms with the Doi Moi um, in the 2000s, like, um, end of the 80s, um, early 19th, uh, early 1990s, um, there was like uh, this big replacement basically of motorbikes by, uh, of bicycles by motorbikes 
that coupled with like massive uh, rural urban migration happening, the explosion of mobilities. So we've, we were in a situation for more than a decade of um, motorbike peaks with a like, motorbike peak with like 80% of the population owning a motorbike, relying entirely on motorbikes for all of their um, daily transportation needs. Uh, that has changed rapidly after approximately 2015-2016 uh, with the um, advent of the car on street networks that are already uh, nearing gridlock. So while motorbikes, you know, were not without causing any all, all sorts of pollution and, and traffic accident, like all sorts of negative externalities, as we call them in transportation studies, let's say that every car that is added um, that is added to those like really narrow and um, you know sparse uh, street spaces is contributing is aggravating uh, these problems exponentially. So in the context of this ongoing transition from motorbike mobility in this in the field of like private mobility from motorbike mobility to car mobility and with in the backdrop the development of those like mass transit development like a metro system under development in Ho Chi Minh City supposed supposed to become the largest um, uh, mass transit system in Southeast Asia my the question really that um, I was interested in was like what what are the changes that this transition are bringing about socially and spatially so um, I tie this study to a literature in human geography and, and, and cultural geography, like on the new mobilities uh, scholarship that has theorized the concept of a mobility transition as follows. So they talk about the transition as a process from one particular moment of assembled technologies, infrastructures, societies, and economies. And transition scholars are especially interested in how the process will involve and in how, like what kind of societal changes does a mobility transition entail. It's important to note that the new mobility scholarship um, is mostly focused on context in the you know, global north, especially concerned with mobility transition to step away from carbon-based mobility and to promote uh, car like, uh, carbon-less mobility. Here, we're talking about a very different type of transition towards the automobile as opposed to away from the automobile. But I argue that the very question of what type of societal changes does such a transition in the mobility sector entail is equally relevant. And as a planner sitting in a school of geography as well, um, I can't help but add a spatial component. What type of social spatial changes does the uh, ongoing mobility transition in Ho Chi Minh City entail is basically the overarching question that I explored in my dissertation. As soon as you use the term social spatial, you kind of have to re refer to uh, the father of like the theory of um, the social production of space. So Henri Lefebvre, a philosopher who argued who um, conceptualized space as, as political. So as I, he articulated this triad between the conceived space, the perceived space, and the lived space, and the production of space being happening in the tensions, in the dialectical relationships between those uh, three uh, poles of the triad. For well, the conceived space here, he defines it as the dominant, dominant, dominating space of uh, the people who code space, you know, the people who have the maps, who have the science, who have the language to, to, to make decisions on how to organize space. Where well, the perceived space is the space of the people as they use it every day and as they contribute to produce and reproduce it by tracing the same past every day, like the daily commute is one of the examples that uh, Henri Lefebvre himself uses to exemplify, like to embody the notion of perceived space as being the space of the people, but the space that they don't really have, like how to say, much control and agency over. As opposed to the lived space, which is also the space of the people, but the space that the people will use in ways that don't, do not necessarily align with how this space was coded in the conceived space. What I did is I developed a theoretical framework that adapts this spatial triad, this theory of the production of space to the production of new mobilities. 
what I do see in the plants that are guiding, like, I mean, I did analyze like the plants that are guiding the transformation of the, transform of the transportation sector in the dominant, domi dominating space of transportation practitioners, um, planners, decision makers as the conceived space of urban mobility. And then I went to look at the tensions, like the dialectical relationships with what's happening in people's daily, everyday experience of mobility as they are themselves adopting a new mobility practices or, you know, live, left, um, how to say, somewhat left behind, you know, from a transition as they cannot follow, say, like um, afford to buy a car just because they're not um, that wealthy. And then in the lift space of um, urban mobility, I went to look at how people are actually, uh, you know, like all that creativity that comes uh, from using transportation spaces, street networks, sidewalks, and also like the, trans the space of flow itself in ways that are not necessarily coded and how that makes for a, a very local uh, experience of mobility and of this mobility transition. So this was um, for the conceptual framework and how I went to, um, analyze those different what, what's going on in these different spaces and the relationships between them. Um, I developed a very mixed method study articulating some quantitative analysis of travel survey data to which I had access through my previous experience working on the transportation on the um, metro development projects with the JICA. So I had a sample supposedly at the time, the only representative sample of a household and travel survey conducted in Southeast Asia. So we had 60,000 observations, 1% uh, of the population in 2014. Um, I analyzed this data in relation to uh, open street map data to get um, information about the street network itself. I triangulated this quanti these quantitative analysis and, and the survey data with um, self-collected data. So I conducted five months of fieldwork. Basically, I went back to Vietnam um, in 2018, eight, three, that was what, three years after I had left and left and lived there for seven years um, to, yeah, really in the spirit of like, uh, now that I had already, I, by then I had already kind of theorized this idea of predictive friction. This is, uh, this is how I came to explain what I think I had experienced, but I needed in a way to, confirm that it was actually happening. So I was kind of in this, um, just to talk, um, you know, research methods for a second, but I was kind of in this weird in between, which made it a little bit difficult to make a case to my PhD committee, because in a sense, I was doing very um, uh, ground, you know, grounded theorizing type of research, very inductive in a way, and also kind of in the spirit of like testing an idea that um, almost like in the hypothesis testing more like, you know, like deductive type of research. So I was in this weird in between. And now the way I see it is more like it was very much of an iterative process, you know, like from an intuition that you, you theorize and then you go back to the field and then inductively you further theorize what you've observed. So this is kind of um, how I, I came back to the field and like really recorded street life through uh, video recordings, uh, conducted interviews, so in-depth interviews with residents uh, that I carefully selected. So not at all a random sample um, to uh, have like a representation of the diversity of profiles in my sample. So in-depth interviews with residents about their mobility practices how they are experiencing this mobility transition. Shorter interviews, more like, um, not sure, we can't really call them interviews, more like on the spot conversations, like participant observations with street vendors and store owners who have this direct connection um, to the street space, like who use it not for mobility, but for, you know, like economic activity reasons and key informants about the broader transformations. I did uh, do all sorts of quantitative analysis that, um, you know, transportation scholars also to show that I'm able to speak their language and join their conversation. So all sorts of like regression analysis, I'm not going to get into the details of, of, of this, but I did here with this slide, I'm just showing you like uh, visually how what I found through um, these, um, this type of analysis. So what you see here is um, 
When you see um, an orange color, it means a negative sign in the relationship. When you see a green color, it means a positive sign in the relationship. If we look at the very first, um, very first uh, vignette, what you see is that all else being equal, um, someone who's riding an, an automobile and who lives in the um, central, like urban core of the city, like denser parts of the city where the, the, the network of alleyways is extremely dense, someone who typically rides an automobile will make fewer trips to go eat out than if this person, all else being equal, were to use any other mode of transfer, uh, were to use a motorbike as a dominant mode, uh, as the, their typical mode of transfer transportation. When you see the negative sign, like the orange color on all of these, like on bicycles and pedestrians, uh, vignette as well, it means that all air, like basically the motorbike, when it comes to you know, the number of trips to it out that one makes on average, uh, all else being equal, the motorbike is the most, like, it beats all the other modes. So bicyclists, pedestrians, like people for whom, like riding a bike or walking is the dominant mode of transportation, will be uh, making fewer of these trips to it out. The only mode that seemed to beat the motorbike was the e-bicycle, the electric bicycle. So someone who relies on an electric bicycle in 2014 for their daily transportation needs and who lives in that dense urban core will make more trips to it out and than if they were to rely on a motorbike unless they live in the outer parts of the city where the network, the street network, especially the density of alleyways, those very narrow streets that are extremely accessible by motorbikes and electric bicycles, but not accessible at all by car. Um, so they will make like, if they live outside, they will make fewer of them. Why did I focus on trips to eat out? So first of all, I did not focus only on trips to eat out. I also focused on trips to socialize, like to go to the pagoda, to visit friends and family that I lumped together. Here, I'm just like picking on this one example of trips to eat out as like one of the types of trips that I was interested in because based on the assumption that these are the types of trips that lead to social interaction, as opposed to mandatory trips, like daily commutes between home and work, uh, trips to pick up or drop off the children, which are, you know, might lead just like shopping trips, might lead to social interaction, but of a different type, like the, ca the casual interaction that, you know, like uh, it's essential to the experience. The social interaction is essential in, in, to the experience. I would assume that it happens more when people make trips to eat out. But there's only so much I could learn from this quantitative analysis for several reasons. Like I don't have any guarantee that there's actually social interaction happening in the end. And also like the type of social interaction that's kind of my big dependent variable. The one thing I'm especially interested in is very much like, you know, the casual social interaction that happens like uh, that has been defined by people who's written about, you know, the beauty of uh, the urban environment, like um, Jane Jacobs, uh, starting with her, like the, the queen of, you know, describing like the, the, um, the organic life um, that comes with um, strangers and semi-strangers sharing the same space. So this type of like casual such social interactions with semi-strangers as a way of building an inclusive space is really the type of interactions that I'm most interested in. And I could not find this through this type of analysis. So I went to this like um, self-collected um, data, collect, uh, data that um, I, I selected uh, streets in three types of uh, three neighborhoods uh, from the urban core that is like more, you know, uh, that was planned during the colonial era, like kind of more of an exceptional type of uh, environment, and yet that has been um, studied more than other environments. So, so to compare, you know, what other, others I have found, I built quite a bit on, it's interesting that the Vietnamese city in the literature that I'm interested in, like especially on public space, has served uh, quite a bit um, to challenge, you know, like um, 
the public-private dichotomy in particular. So Annette Kim is one of who wrote a book called Sidewalk about street vendors in Ho Chi Minh City. Very much, she was part of my dissertation committee. She very much informed, you know, my thinking about like um, public space and the blurry boundaries between, you know, private and public uses of, of spaces. Um, Marie Bigibert Flutre is another person whose like, scholarship has inspired me a lot. And if I selected, you know, some street segments to observe in that um, more ordinary neighborhood, like ordinary residential neighborhood uh, of Funyong, it's also because, you know, to be building on her work uh, quite directly, I also included some uh, street segments in District 3, which is like a somewhat in between that more, you know, gridded, like planned development and typical residential development. And I also observed what's going on in like this very modern part, like this part of the city, District 7, that is being planned according to an ideal of um, modernity to see what's happening there. If in a way, like in that space, they're not a little bit further, you know, like uh, further away on the, on the, the train towards like uh, transitioning towards the car again. In each of these um, neighborhoods, I selected street segments of different type. And I recorded a total of 333 videos. So in, on each of these uh, segments, I recorded um, a, what I call a side video. So that's what you see on the left. It's like a traveling shot to capture what's happening on the sidewalk and what are the places that structure the built environment. By that, I mean, you know, every single store, every single house, every single um, like linear different use. Um, I recorded all of this. And I also recorded on each of these streets, I recorded a static shot to conduct a, a, a traffic count, just to count what every single uh, entity on the move, including like motorbikes, pedestrians, cars, buses, trucks, and so on and so forth. And I did these recordings, these two recordings six times over the course of one day in each of these, um, so every three hours basically from six to 10 p.m. Um, in each of these 20 street segments that I had selected with the help of a research assistant to whom I owe so much uh, we counted every single person, vehicle uh, activity, and we classified, I classified them, he counted. Um, and the way I classified those users was, you know, I had some counts that I considered proxies for the type of street life. You know, these types of interactions I was talking about between strangers, semi-strangers, uh, transactional or not transactional, but what is constitutive, um, like I mean, proxies for street life or elements of street life, I counted the number of people who are just hanging out in public space, not the people who are walking, these were counted as pedestrians, but the people who are just sitting there, like squatting, eating, drinking, like, you know, just people's, people's watching. Um, so I counted the number of people per half mile. I counted the number of food and drink businesses because in Vietnamese streets, on the Vietnamese streets, you typically have, you know, some seating available, even if it's just one small low plastic stool next to a, a rundown plastic table, you will have like a space, any food or drink business will, you know, typically be a place to socialize, like what we call a third place in, uh, in the public space literature. Then I classified, you know, based on the traffic counts, I, I counted the number of like motorbikes, pedestrians, bicycles, like the entities on the move by mode. And I classified those variables as um, indicators of the flow, the nature of the flow. Then I recorded that we counted, you know, all the different locations. So what you see here is like on all streets, what the indications that you see is that if you were to take to go for a walk for half a mile on the average, or like average of all the ones I selected, average uh, street of Ho Chi Minh City, if you were to walk for basically 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, you would pass in front of 134 locations. You would pass in front of approximately 100 people just hanging out there. Of all the places in front of which you would pass, there would be 68% of them being retail, like being stores. 
like only 21% of housing on the ground floor directly connecting to the street. And of all the people who are hanging out, 25 would be uh, running a place where you are welcome to sit and hang out. After uh, evaluating all of these variables, like there were a few that I didn't really know where to fit. Like when I see a sidewalk, someone uh, 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 on the sidewalk in the space of flow, but a street vendor, uh, 25 street vendors uh, over 10 minutes on average, you would you would cross whose path you would cross. I didn't know where to fit these people. Are they part of the built environment or are they part of the flow? You know, like uh, they can go away anytime. Actually, they don't, very few of them stay all day long. The people I call the motor buyers, these are the people I show you images of this phenomenon in a second. Like it's an extremely uh, common situation on Vietnamese streets of someone who's just steps foot. Let me show you a picture right now. Someone who just steps foot on the ground stops in front of a, of, of, a, of a vendor, or it can be a formal, you know, like um, formal in the sense like integrated, you know, like a store, uh, steps one foot on the ground, watches, like makes an order and takes, takes, it, takes whatever they purchased uh, to go. I call this, this, this phenomenon that this action, I called it motor buying in the sense that, you know, it's like window shopping, but on a motorbike and it's buying from the motorbike. I didn't know where to fit this, this either. It's like at the intersection between what's going on in the space of flow and what's going on in the space of activity, where I'm borrowing these terms from Manuel Castells and this, um, who has argued at a broader level, like at all, um, I don't know, like um, from the, especially, you know, in the aggregate, the global level, that the way the flows of connectivity um, interact with the place of places, I mean, flows tend to supersede places and reorganize the geography of places. And what I've argued with this notion of predictive friction is that what we are seeing, especially through things like motor buying, is definitely a connection between what happens in the space of flows and what happens in the space of places. So I classified all of these users and I showed that uh, you can see depending on the type of street and depending on some of these flow characteristics and activity characteristics and how they interact with each other, that you have something going on, like the connection, the connection between the two, which I did call like the mechanism that connects the space of flows and the space of places, which I call productive friction. You have like varying levels of friction depending on the type of uh, space, street space that you're looking at. Um, evidence of this comes from observing uh, vending tactics. So uh, uh, evidence of this and also of like further evidence, further explanations for how it happens. Vending tactics. So I did look at where uh, street vendors position themselves in the built environment. And I did notice that depending on the type of flow that they're trying to catch, their positioning is different. This is the typical, most street vendors have a, a, a cart uh, that is uh, that high facing uh, the lane. And these, these street vendors are aiming to catch the motorbike flow because of the motorbike, the possibility for motorbike riders to motorbike, to just like pause for a second, make a look at what's in the, in the window, make an order directly from the vendor. As opposed to vendors, fewer of them, but in some places, they are the majority, who are trying to catch the pedestrian flow. This vendor is actually turning her back to the lane and facing the sidewalk. She's, at, um, she's lower, closer to the ground. And why is that? Because this is easier for a pedestrian to have their gaze go directly to what, um, you know, what, what, what's on display as merchandise. Here, the gaze is directly, the merchandise is directly at eye level for the motorbike rider. So what I learned from these observations of vending tactics and from talking directly, you know, with the street vendors who would tell me through these short interactions, well, it's very easy, the more traffic, the more customers. This was like a vendor who sells like uh, banh mi, like, which is something that people consume mostly for breakfast in Vietnam. And she was very much referring to, um, she was very much referring to the motorbike traffic. Actually, 
through another set of observations, I realized, especially in one-way streets, were particularly informative because in Vietnam, on one-way streets, you will have all the motor the motorbikes on the right side of the street. You will have the cars on the left side, and what you can observe is that um, street vendors will all be on the right side, with just a few exceptions. If you have, say, a big hospital or a big school on the left side, then you will have some vendors around those like uh, spot of uh, intense activity because there's a captive demand, so to speak, around those spots. So I learned from these types of observation to explain further, you know, what about the flow explains whether or not there is productive friction. And one of the characteristic, for example, is the density of the flow, because having a lot of people on the move mean a high density of people who potentially can see, you know, <laughs> through visual perception, just what's around, what's available, um, like as, so in human activity, so here I'm mostly talking about commercial activity, but the production, production, productive friction idea is not limited. I mean, that's not how, I, I don't see it as limited to just like um, commercial activity as, a, as an outcome. But anyway, the density of the flow seems a key. The speed of the flow seem to, seems to matter as well because this, the flow as the flow is slow, you know, is it's easier for people to actually engage through visual perception first and possibly actually act, you know, interact with what's available in the built environment through direct perception. The malleability is an important, seems to be an important factor for predictive frictions to happen of the built environment. And that malleability, what I mean by that is like, it's, you know, quite unique to places like Southeast Asian cities where street vending is tolerated, not exactly allowed, but tolerated. It's, it's possible for these activities to go wherever the friction happens, like to sh shuffle around, to move around, depending on like um, whether there's a point of friction or not. Motor buying, I think I already talked about it, and, and the visual perception, the ability to pause on a whim uh, to buy something that seems like interesting, um, appealing, is uh, a, a factor that also speaks to this question, like the, these characteristics of the flow that I have identified, the, the size of the vehicle, like the fact that, um, you know, like it's possible to just stop without interrupting traffic too much, stop on a whim, um, is like, these are like factors that I have identified. Parking practices are another um, piece of evidence for the productive friction idea, because when you see, you know, in the public space literature, people I have uh, learned so much from, but um, also challenged a little because there's kind of this, uh, they've made this uh, very uh, strong um, argument that parking is antithetical to the public nature of, of street spaces. And I, I, I tend to disagree with this because when you see a part like streets, the very narrow sidewalks of Ho Chi Minh City and, and other Vietnamese cities tend to be overcrowded with motorbikes, which is problematic in many ways because yes, it's difficult to walk and imagine someone in a wheelchair, it would be really inaccessible. At the same time, when it comes to the public nature of these spaces, uh, we can uh, assume, you know, that every single vehicle that is in that space that's not on the move, but it is in the space of places, but it is still an instrument of mobility that belongs to the space of, 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 of flows. When that interaction happens, when that vehicle stops in the built environment, what it means is that someone somewhere nearby is engaging in some form of activity. And just here, that's, I guess, a good illustration. Like you can assume that all of these kids who are just like having tea together late at night on one of the most vibrant public spaces of Ho Chi Minh City, the Wing Hue Pedestrian Boulevard, um, these are their motorbikes. So the same here, like these people who are parking here, these are like the four motorbikes of the four people having breakfast on their way. So if you don't allow for this productive friction to happen, if you don't allow for this integration, like in insertion of the flow into the space of places, what happens to the street vendor? Like how does this street vendor makes a living, you know? Street vending, why street vending seems so important? Like I, like I said, my outcome is not necessarily vending aspects, not the commercial retail aspect that interests me, but we know from the literature, like how important, like the role, uh, the critical role that street vending plays and informal uh, labor in general plays in the social integration of, um, for the most part, poor rural migrants 
who are um, resorting to these activities like as a part of a process to further integrating um, the economy of urban places. Uh, in Ho Chi Minh City at the times, so I should have said that earlier, but just down to a few figures. Um, I guess at the time of my observations, we're talking about the city of approximately maybe a bit more than 8 million people. There were 8 million motorbikes. There was 1 million street vendors. These are estimates because especially the number of street vendors, it's hard to tell. But 1 million, um, like not street vendors only, but 1 million uh, household businesses who independent household businesses within which uh, you know that street vendors, like this category uh, includes street vendors, street vendors. So some very, I have to really uh, rush through the other things I had to show you, just give you a glimpse, but I, I want to take the time to conclude on this. So what I've learned from this notion of productive friction, like the, I mean, what the argument that I made, when it comes to this broader question of social spatial changes that the mobility transition entails, um, what I, I see here is um, at a time of motorbike peak, dominant motorbike mobility, we're talking about a time where the level of friction everywhere seemed to be, I mean, on, on commercial corridors and avenues and streets in Ho Chi Minh City, which is like most of the streets besides, you know, except for the narrow alleyways that are the largest, like most streets are extremely narrow and do not support all that activity. But on the streets and boulevard, very high level of friction for sure um, that enables, you know, like this one tenth of the population or more to make a living, to find a way in the society uh, by just, uh, you know, interacting on a daily basis with that constant flow of people on the move. When you move, when you shift to um, a new mode of transportation as the car that does not allow as, you know, like this integration into the flow of into the space of places the cars just cannot stop on the way and and without like causing a major traffic jam which they already caused in the first place but they just cannot stop on the way as motorbikes do and and the direct perceptions are you know like um in, impeded by by just a, a windshield tempered by a windshield um, the interviews with people who were um, considering buying a car in the near future because they could afford it and because for all sorts of legitimate reasons, you know, the kids were older, there were two of them, like uh, relying on the motorbike was not possible anymore. They wanted their kids to be safe in traffic, they were tired of sitting in, um, uh, like, breathing in, you know, exhaust pipes and all, all sorts of legitimate reasons, but um, people envisioning like moon purchasing a car soon if i would ask them of all the places you went to yesterday after i remember one interview in particular someone who had um you know you I first i would first ask where did you what did you do yesterday where did you go and this person's answer at first was like oh i didn't go anywhere i just went to work and then i came back home and then i would be like on the way to work did you stop anywhere no i didn't stop anywhere did you buy anything? Yeah, I bought breakfast. I'm like, how did this happen? <laughs> and then later you realize, yeah, this person had gone through, uh, had gone to, had made like 13 stops actually on their way uh, total, like buying every single ingredient for a different uh, vendor on the, uh, on the market later on during the day and everything and stopping for a coffee, like uh, on a whim, all sorts of like stops made in productive friction mode, you know? And, um, Later in the conversation, when this very, very person is telling me, yeah, we're buying a car, we're like uh, thinking about buying a VinFast, <laughs> we're buying a car soon with my wife, and I'm like, all the places you went to yesterday, do you think you would be able to go with your car? The first answer would be, this happened more than once, but the first answer would be, yeah, of course, why not? And then, you know, thinking back, be like, oh, actually, no, I guess I have to buy everything from the supermarket, you know, and have breakfast at home, there's just nowhere to park, nowhere to stop. So as we're transitioning to a mode that is not as conducive to productive friction, um, transit in a way is just the same. Like it's promoted in developing, like uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, under the same premise, like, you know, the narrative of the projects I was working on in the past is all about, um, you know, promoting sustainable development, promoting like um, it's transit is, um, 
promoted in the plants in the conceived space of mobility as the mode that is the most equitable, the most sustainable, and so on and so forth. But it will definitely cause kind of a spacing out of the friction point. It's not, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying it, it's just to be expected, I would argue. And the friction point will probably uh, concentrate around transit nodes. But there are, we can expect, you know, as the flows are being disintegrated, they disconnected from the space of places, we can expect a withering of the public realm. And the reason why I, be, I like to believe that the uh, planning community has responded quite, has responded quite um, positively to this idea um, is because transportation planners, urban designers, like um, for the longest time, there has been um, this, it's known that some modes, especially promoting um, pedestrian spaces is something that uh, you hear all the time, you know, that uh, this is how you make vibrant public spaces. But at the same time, what I've been arguing with this notion of predictive friction is it's not so much about whether the mode is motorized or non-motorized. It's very much about does the mode, like, does the flow of people on the move, does it have the possibility to interact like in a longitudinal manner with this environment uh, that, and does this environment uh, host, you know, a myriad of activities in which people can actually engage. What I've been arguing is whether the flow is um, motorized, non-motorized, doesn't matter so much. What matters is like if we are planning for spaces where the flow goes through the space in a frictionless manner, uh, it will be as unproductive from a product from a vibrancy, like inclusivity perspective, as a, an extremely congested um, place, you know, where people are just like stuck in the place of flow and do not have any opportunity to interact with the place of the space, the places that surround them to create that communication, that vibrancy that we expect from great urban places. So what I've been arguing is to plan for street networks to while keeping in mind, so speaking to transportation scholars, my argument is like, we need to keep in mind that every time we, uh, every time we intervene in the street networks, we're intervening on the primary public space and therefore, um, like moving, you know, along this gradient from frictionless to uh, high friction mobility. And in some places, at least, we really want to aim for that middle point where the flow interacts, uh, that happy middle where the flow interacts with its surrounding environment. And of course, we'll always need um, places, you know, the ambulance to go through as fast as possible in places where you have frictionless mobility. But I've been arguing in favor of planning for street networks according to their level of frictions as opposed to their level of service, which is the typical way of thinking about them um, in transportation planning. I will say just two words about this next project <laughs> that I'm working on at the moment, where we're looking at um, platform-based opportunity, like platform-based work opportunities and trying to see uh, like how it relates to uh, women's empowerment. The main thing I want to say about this, so I am mindful of the time. Uh, the main thing I want to say about this is um, actually, I'll stop here. And I would just say that in the research that I'm doing, such as the one was I just, uh, the title I just presented, I'm carrying with me, you know, this concern for when you have like those um, broader technological uh, innovations, like whether it's like a new form of mobility that is coming to disrupt like a, the a system of mobility, or whether it's a new form of accessing work and sociability on platforms as opposed to opening a small business at home. Um, how does, how does, like how, what I'm, like the outlook that I'm keeping in my research is focusing on how it affects people's lived experience in relation to those broader, the broader structural changes, socially and spatially, that um, these innovations are impacting. So I'm very sorry I didn't actually spend more time on like previous uh, work than ongoing work, but I'm happy to um, answer any questions you may have. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Professor Jean, for the, the really great talk. Yeah, the end, I was really, as I was listening to your talk, especially the conclusion, I was thinking about how this would, this type of movement and frictionless movement empowers women. 
in terms of how it empowers them. I'm thinking if I didn't have to go to the grocery store and could just, it could live like this, how that would change the way I live my life. And it looks like that's going to be some of a focus of your work moving forward. Um, yeah, I mean, if this is why there is like another connection through my uh, the, my next project, like my ongoing project is through like this gender lens, it, lens is important, especially because we know that um, in whether it's in Vietnam, in Thailand, in Cambodia, like those three places I'm looking, I, I've been looking at um, women are underrepresented in terms of um, mm -hmm. employment. But in the informal sector, they're over, like, uh, they, they, they represent the majority of workers. Mm -hmm. So this is why it's like especially, <laughs> like it seems especially important <laughs> to care for the continuity or at least like the possibility for these means of survival. Yeah. Yeah, that's how you're looking at the gig economy a little yeah. bit too. Yeah. So yeah, this is what we're looking at. We are from the premise, you know, we know two things like um, that, women who do join uh, the labor force will be more likely um, to do it in the informal sector and also will mm -hmm. be more likely to do it from home. So kind of like the premise of this next study is that now that you have all these opportunities to join, you know, like the food delivery apps and all, but from the cooking side, do these represent like further opportunities for women to join, like um, to, to gain empowerment through labor? So we do approach, this is kind of the, the question, like the idea, the hypothesis guiding the work. Um, and one piece that I'm especially uh, fond of in this research is actually we all including in the set of interviews, we've been conducting like a hundred interviews in each of the countries we're looking at. We all included informal like women uh, vendors in the informal sector and trying to get that, um, you know, what are they like, how do they feel about these possibilities that now exist to extend their business by mm -hmm. starting to sell online as well, in addition or instead. And what we're learning, which seems like, uh, which I find particularly interesting is that these people who, if our hypothesis holds true, would be, would benefit the most from these new opportunities in the platform mm -hmm. economy are the least likely to join for reasons that, um, you know, you can imagine like um, skills issues, like technological issues, they don't have the phone that have enough data or enough, yeah. you see, like a capacity uh, to actually uh, run these apps. No, that's, that's fascinating. We'll have to have you back when you have the, um, those analyses completed. And please do um, enter questions in the Q&A. We have one from Eric White. Hi, Eric. Um, you primarily discussed relatively in individualized mobility. How does more collective public transportation means of transportation like buses, vans, et cetera, fit into and perhaps modify the patterns of mobility flows, productive frictions, and social interactions you discovered? Yeah, it's a really good question. I only touched on this issue at the very end, uh, as we are uh, faced with the um, development of a mass uh, transit system. Uh, the backbone of it will be this metro system, but in the in the same uh, in the same breath, uh, there's there are major improvements being made in the bus system, and it is working in the sense that we see the modal shift of bus riders. Uh, increase what I'm um, the reason why I don't focus so much on uh, public transit uh, in this analysis is just because it's this, the modal share is just so so small we're talking about like mm -hmm. less than three percent so people do rely mostly entirely let's say on these individualized mobility uh, means so collective transit is definitely um, it's, it's gonna come, it's happening. I mean, we don't have any evidence of any place where a, a transit system of this sort was developed and was not successful. So there's no reason, it should work. It should serve a population, but maybe for different types of strips. Another thing that we're, we are learning in, in like uh, decentering a little bit perspectives on ev everyday urban mobility is that in places like Ho Chi Minh City, actually people are extremely multimodal. Like if you look at the statistics, it seems like the motorbike is so prevalent, but actually when you start like uh, breaking down all of these many trips that people who rely mostly on their motorbike, but do over the course of the day, 
to have lunch in the daytime, they would just walk to a, a lunch place. If they do have a car, actually, it happens that, you know, they use it only on weekends to go out of town because they know, they experience it. They are the first one to suffer from how <laughs> bad mobility, <laughs> how bad the mobility you get uh, is if you want to rely on your car. So the bus will fit is, is fitting. You only have like uh, some segments of the population who rely on it, students a lot. Um, definitely people who cannot afford uh, their private motorbike rely on the bus. But now you see, you see and you can expect that the metro will play this role as well. Like for certain types of trips will probably work and be uh, relied on for others. Maybe people will, I guess I expect people should remain multimodal. What it means for productive frictions, I think that spacing out is like the main idea uh, that I was uh, bringing. Like if we are to push to promote a system where people rely mostly on these modes, I think the spacing out of friction point, that's concentration in some uh, nodes, transit nodes, and the spacing out along the lines where you have like a tunnel effect taking place. Thank you so much. And I think we're getting close to one. So unless somebody would like to type in a question, I want to uh, thank Professor Jean for the, the great talk. Thank everybody for attending our seminar series this semester. And remind you that if you have time to fill out our survey, please do. It helps us with planning. Oh, we have one more question, but I think um, I'll have this person address this to you on their own. Um, but really, again, I think this is a perfect seminar to end the semester with as we think about our ever-changing world. And if I may say, seeing pictures of Southeast Asia made me really excited to travel there. So thanks for the really compelling talk. And thank you to everybody. And we will see you hopefully this Wednesday at our get together or at the movie next Sunday. Thank you very much.